In publishing these short sketches based upon the numerous cases in which my companion's singular gifts have made us the listeners to, and eventually the actors in, some strange drama, it is only natural that I should dwell rather upon his successes than upon his failures, and this not so much for the sake of his reputation, for indeed it was when he was at his wit's end that his energy and his versatility were most admirable, but because where he failed it happened too often that no one else succeeded, and that the tale was left forever without a conclusion. Now and again, however, it chanced that even when he erred, the truth was still discovered. I have noted of some half-dozen cases of the kind, of which the affair of the second stain, and that which I am now about to recount, are the two which present the strongest features of interest. Sherlock Holmes was a man who seldom took exercise for exercise's sake. Few men were capable of greater muscular effort, and he was undoubtedly one of the finest boxers of his weight that I have ever seen. But he looked upon aimless bodily exertion as a waste of energy, and he seldom bestirred himself, save when there was some professional object to be served. Then he was absolutely untiring and indefatigable. That he should have kept himself in training under such circumstances is remarkable, but his diet was usually of the sparest, and his habits were simple to the verge of austerity. Save for the occasional use of cocaine, he had no vices, and he only turned to the drug as a protest against the monotony of existence, when cases were scanty and the papers uninteresting. One day in early spring, he had so far relaxed as to go for a walk with me in the park, where the first faint shoots of green were breaking out upon the elms, and the sticky spearheads of the chestnuts were just beginning to burst into their five-fold leaves. For two hours we rambled about together, in silence for the most part, as befits two men who know each other intimately. It was nearly five before we were back in Baker Street once more. Beg pardon, sir, said our page boy as he opened the door. There's been a gentleman here asking for you, sir. Holmes glanced reproachfully at me. So much for afternoon walks, said he. Has this gentleman gone, then? Yes, sir. Didn't you ask him in? Yes, sir, he came in. How long did he wait? Half an hour, sir. He was a very restless gentleman, sir, a walkin' and a stampin' all the time he was here. I was waitin' outside the door, sir, and I could hear him. At last he outs into the passage, and he cries, Is that man never going to come? Those were his very words, sir. You'll only need to wait a little longer, says I. Then I'll wait in the open air, for I feel half choked, says he. I'll be back before long. And with that, he ups and he outs, and all I could say wouldn't hold him back. Well, well, you did your best, said Holmes as we walked into our room. It's very annoying, though, Watson. I was badly in need of a case, and this looks from the man's impatience as if it were of importance. Hello, that's not your pipe on the table. He must have left his behind him. A nice old briar with a good long stem of what the tobacconists call amber. I wonder how many real amber mouthpieces there are in London. Some people think that a fly in it is a sign. Well, he must have been disturbed in his mind to leave a pipe behind him, which he evidently values highly. How do you know that he values it highly? I asked. Well, I should put the original cost of the pipe at seven and sixpence. Now it has, you see, been twice mended, once in the wooden stem and once in the amber. Each of these mends, done, as you observe, with silver bands, must have cost more than the pipe did originally. The man must value the pipe highly when he prefers to patch it up rather than buy a new one with the same money. Anything else? I asked, for Holmes was turning the pipe about in his hand and staring at it in his peculiar, pensive way. He held it up and tapped on it with his long, thin forefinger, as a professor might who was lecturing on a bone. Pipes are occasionally of extraordinary interest, said he. Nothing has more individuality, save perhaps watches and bootlaces. The indications here, however, are neither very marked nor very important. The owner is obviously a muscular man, left-handed, with an excellent set of teeth, careless in his habits, and with no need to practice economy. My friend threw out the information in a very off-hand way, but I saw that he cocked his eye at me to see if I had followed his reasoning. You think a man must be well-to-do if he smokes a seven-shilling pipe? 
said I. This is Grosvenor mixture at eight pence an ounce, Holmes answered, knocking a little out on his palm. As he might get an excellent smoke for half the price, he has no need to practice economy. And the other points? He has been at the habit of lighting his pipe at lamps and gas jets. You can see that it is quite charred all down one side. Of course a match could not have done that. Why should a man hold a match to the side of his pipe? But you cannot light it at a lamp without getting the bowl charred. And it is all on the right side of the pipe. From that I gather that he is a left-handed man. You hold your own pipe to the lamp, and see how naturally you, being right-handed, hold the left side to the flame. You might do it once the other way, but not as a constancy. This has always been held so. Then he has bitten through his amber. It takes a muscular, energetic fellow, and one with a good set of teeth, to do that. But if I am not mistaken, I hear him upon the stair, so we shall have something more interesting than his pipe to study. An instant later our door opened, and a tall young man entered the room. He was well but quietly dressed in a dark grey suit, and carried a brown, wide awake in his hand. I should have put him at about thirty, though he was really some years older. I beg your pardon, said he with some embarrassment. I suppose I should have knocked. Yes, of course I should have knocked. The fact is that I'm a little upset, and you must put it all down to that. He passed his hand over his forehead like a man who is half dazed, and then fell rather than sat down upon a chair. I can see that you have not slept for a night or two, said Holmes in his easy, genial way. That tries a man's nerves more than work, and more even than pleasure. May I ask how I can help you? I wanted your advice, sir. I don't know what to do, and my whole life seems to have gone to pieces. You wish to employ me as a consulting detective? Not that only. I want your opinion as a judicious man, as a man of the world. I want to know what I ought to do next. I hope to God you'll be able to tell me. He spoke in little sharp, jerky outbursts, and it seemed to me that to speak at all was very painful to him, and that his will all through was overriding his inclinations. It's a very delicate thing, said he. One does not like to speak of one's domestic affairs to strangers. It seems dreadful to discuss the conduct of one's wife with two men whom I have never seen before. It's horrible to have to do it. But I've got to the end of my tether, and I must have advice. My dear Mr. Grant Munro, began Holmes. Our visitor sprang from his chair. What? he cried. You know my name. If you wish to preserve your incognito, said Holmes, smiling, I would suggest that you cease to write your name upon the lining of your hat, or else that you turn the crown towards the person whom you are addressing. I was about to say that my friend and I have listened to a good many strange secrets in this room, and that we have had the good fortune to bring peace to many troubled souls. I trust that we may do as much for you. Might I beg you, as time may prove to be of importance, to furnish me with the facts of your case without further delay? Our visitor again passed his hand over his forehead as if he found it bitterly hard. From every gesture and expression, I could see that he was a reserved, self-contained man, with a dash of pride in his nature, more likely to hide his wounds than to expose them. Then suddenly, with a fierce gesture of his closed hand, like one who throws reserve to the winds, he began. The facts are these, Mr. Holmes, said he. I'm a married man, and have been so for three years, during that time my wife and I have loved each other as fondly and lived as happily as any two that ever were joined. We have not had a difference, not one in thought or word or deed. And now, since last Monday, there has suddenly sprung up a barrier between us, and I find that there is something in her life and in her thought of which I know as little as if she were the woman who brushes by me in the street. We are estranged, and I want to know why. Now there's one thing that I want to impress upon you before I go any further, Mr. Holmes. Effie loves me. Don't let there be any mistake about that. She loves me with her whole heart and soul, and never more than now. I know it. I feel it. I don't want to argue about that. A man can tell easily enough when a woman loves him. But there's this secret between us. And we can never be the same until it is cleared. Kindly let me have the facts, Mr. Monroe said Holmes with some impatience. I'll tell you what I know about Effie's history. She was a widow when I met her first, though quite young, only twenty-five. Her name then was Mrs. Hebron. 
She went out to America when she was young and lived in the town of Atlanta, where she married this Hebron, who was a lawyer with a good practice. They had one child, but the yellow fever broke out badly in the place, and both husband and child died of it. I have seen his death certificate. This sickened her of America, and she came back to live with a maiden aunt at Pinner in Middlesex. I may mention that her husband had left her comfortably off, and that she had a capital of about four thousand five hundred pounds, which had been so well invested by him that it returned an average of seven per cent. She had only been six months at Pinner when I met her. We fell in love with each other, and we married a few weeks afterwards. I am a hop merchant myself, and as I have an income of seven or eight hundred, we found ourselves comfortably off and took a nice eighty-pound-a-year villa at Norbury. Our little place was very countrified, considering that it is so close to town. We had an inn and two houses a little above us, and a single cottage at the other side of the field which faces us, and except those there were no houses until you got halfway to the station. My business took me into town at certain seasons, but in summer I had less to do, and then in our country home my wife and I were just as happy as could be wished. I tell you that there never was a shadow between us until this accursed affair began. There's one thing I ought to tell you before I go further. When we married, my wife made over all her property to me, rather against my will, for I saw how awkward it would be if my business affairs went wrong. However, she would have it so, and it was done. Well, about six weeks ago, she came to me. Jack, said she, when you took my money, you said that if ever I wanted any, I was to ask you for it. Certainly, said I, it's all your own. Well, said she, I want a hundred pounds. I was a bit staggered at this, for I had imagined it was simply a new dress or something of the kind that she was after. What on earth for? I asked. Oh, said she, in her playful way, you said that you were only my banker, and bankers never ask questions, you know. If you really mean it, of course you shall have the money, said I. Oh, yes, I really mean it. And you won't tell me what you want it for? Some day, perhaps, but not just at present, Jack. So I had to be content with that, though it was the first time that there had ever been any secret between us. I gave her a check, and I never thought any more of the matter. It may have nothing to do with what came afterwards, but I thought it only right to mention it. Well, I told you just now that there is a cottage not far from our house. There is just a field between us, but to reach it, you have to go along the road and then turn down a lane. Just beyond it is a nice little grove of scotch firs, and I used to be very fond of strolling down there, for trees are always a neighborly kind of things. The cottage had been standing empty this eight months, and it was a pity, for it was a pretty two-storied place, with an old-fashioned porch and honeysuckle about it. I have stood many a time and thought what a neat little homestead it would make. Well, last Monday evening I was taking a stroll down that way, when I met an empty van coming up the lane and saw a pile of carpets and things lying about on the grass plot beside the porch. It was clear that the cottage had at last been let. I walked past it and wondered what sort of folk they were who had come to live so near us, and as I looked I suddenly became aware that a face was watching me out of one of the upper windows. I don't know what there was about that face, Mr. Holmes, but it seemed to send a chill right down my back. I was some little way off so that I could not make out the features, but there was something unnatural and inhuman about the face. That was the impression that I had, and I moved quickly forwards to get a nearer view of the person who was watching me. But as I did so, the face suddenly disappeared, so suddenly that it seemed to have been plucked away into the darkness of the room. I stood for five minutes thinking the business over and trying to analyze my impressions. I could not tell if the face were that of a man or a woman. It had been too far from me for that, but its color was what had impressed me most. It was of a livid, chalky white, and with something set and rigid about it which was shockingly unnatural. So disturbed was I that I determined to see a little more of the new inmates of the cottage. I approached and knocked at the door, which was instantly opened by a tall, gaunt woman with a harsh, forbidding face. "'What may you be wantin?' she asked in a northern accent. I'm your neighbor over yonder, said I, nodding towards my house. I see that you have only just moved in, so I thought that if I could be of any help to you in any... I will just ask you when we want you, said she, and shut the door in my face. Annoyed at the churlish rebuff, I turned my back and walked home. All evening, though I tried to think of other things, my mind would still turn to the apparition at the window and the rudeness of the woman. 
I determined to say nothing about the foreman to my wife, for she is a nervous, highly strung woman, and I had no wish that she would share the unpleasant impression which had been produced upon myself. I remarked to her, however, before I fell asleep, that the cottage was now occupied, to which she returned no reply. I am usually an extremely sound sleeper. It has been a standing jest in the family that nothing could ever wake me during the night. And yet somehow on that particular night, whether it may have been the slight excitement produced by my little adventure or not, I know not, but I slept much more lightly than usual. Half in my dreams I was dimly conscious that something was going on in the room, and gradually became aware that my wife had dressed herself and was slipping on her mantle and bonnet. My lips were parted to murmur out some sleepy words of surprise or remonstrance at this untimely preparation, when suddenly my half-opened eyes fell upon her face, illuminated by the candlelight. An astonishment held me dumb. She wore an expression such as I had never seen before, such as I should have thought her incapable of assuming. She was deadly pale and breathing fast, glancing furtively towards the bed as she fastened her mantle to see if she had disturbed me. Then, thinking that I was still asleep, she slipped noiselessly from the room, and an instant later I heard a sharp creaking which could only come from the hinges of the front door. I sat up in bed and wrapped my knuckles against the rail to make certain that I was truly awake. Then I took my watch from under the pillow. It was three in the morning. What on this earth could my wife be doing out on the country road at three in the morning? I had sat for about twenty minutes turning the thing over in my mind and trying to find some possible explanation. The more I thought, the more extraordinary and inexplicable did it appear. I was still puzzling over it when I heard the door gently close again and her footsteps coming up the stairs. Where in the world have you been, Effie? I asked as she entered. She gave a violent start and a kind of gasping cry when I spoke, and that cry and start troubled me more than all the rest for there was something indescribably guilty about them. My wife had always been a woman of a frank, open nature, and it gave me a chill to see her slinking into her own room and crying out and wincing when her own husband spoke to her. You awake, Jack? she cried with a nervous laugh. Why, I thought that nothing could awake you. Where have you been? I asked more sternly. I don't wonder that you are surprised, said she, and I could see that her fingers were trembling as she undid the fastenings of her mantle. Why, I never remember having done such a thing in my life before. The fact is that I felt as though I were choking, and I had a perfect longing for a breath of fresh air. I really think that I should have fainted if I had not gone out. I stood at the door for a few minutes, and now I am quite myself again. All the time that she was telling me this story, she never once looked in my direction, and her voice was quite unlike her usual tones. It was evident to me that she was saying what was false. I said nothing in reply but turned my face to the wall, sick at heart, with my mind filled with a thousand venomous doubts and suspicions. What was it that my wife was concealing from me? Where had she been during that strange expedition? I felt that I should have no peace until I knew, and yet I shrank from asking her again after once she had told me what was false. All the rest of the night I tossed and tumbled, framing theory after theory, each more unlikely than the last. I should have gone to the city that day, but I was too disturbed in my mind to be able to pay attention to business matters. My wife seemed to be as upset as myself, and I could see from the little questioning glances which she kept shooting at me that she understood that I disbelieved her statement, and that she was at her wits' end what to do. We hardly exchanged a word during breakfast, and immediately afterwards I went out for a walk, that I might think the matter out in the fresh morning air. I went as far as the Crystal Palace, spent an hour in the grounds, and was back in Norbury by one o'clock. It happened that my way took me past the cottage, and I stopped for an instant to look at the windows and to see if I could catch a glimpse of the strange face which had looked out at me on the day before. As I stood there, imagine my surprise, Mr. Holmes, when the door suddenly opened and my wife walked out. I was struck dumb with astonishment at the sight of her but my emotions were nothing to those which showed themselves upon her face when our eyes met. She seemed for an instant to wish to shrink back inside the house again, and then, seeing how useless all concealment must be, she came forward, with a very white face and frightened eyes which belied the smile upon her lips. 
Ah, Jack, she said, I have just been in to see if I can be of any assistance to our new neighbors. Why do you look at me like that, Jack? You're not angry with me. So, said I, this is where you went during the night. What do you mean? she cried. You came here, I am sure of it. Who are these people that you should visit them at such an hour? I have not been here before. How can you tell me what you know is false? I cried. Your very voice changes as you speak. When have I ever had a secret from you? I shall enter that cottage and I shall probe the matter to the bottom. No, no, Jack, for God's sake, she gasped in uncontrollable emotion. Then as I approached the door, she seized my sleeve and pulled me back with convulsive strength. I implore you not to do this, Jack, she cried. I swear that I will tell you everything some day, but nothing but misery can come of it if you enter that cottage. Then as I tried to shake her off, she clung to me in a frenzy of entreaty. Trust me, Jack, she cried. Trust me only this once. You will never have cause to regret it. You know that I would not have a secret from you if it were not for your own sake. Our whole lives are at stake in this. If you come home with me, all will be well. If you force your way into that cottage, all is over between us. There was such earnestness, such despair in her manner that her words arrested me, and I stood irresolute before the door. I will trust you on one condition, and on one condition only, said I at last. It is that this mystery comes to an end from now. You are at liberty to preserve your secret, but you must promise me that there shall be no more nightly visits, no more doings which are kept from my knowledge. I am willing to forget those which are past if you will promise that there shall be no more in the future. I was sure that you would trust me, she cried with a great sigh of relief. It shall be just as you wish. Come away, oh, come away, up to the house. Still pulling at my sleeve, she led me away from the cottage. As we went, I glanced back, and there was that yellow, livid face, watching us, out of the upper window. What link could there be between that creature and my wife, or how could the coarse, rough woman whom I had seen the day before be connected with her? It was a strange puzzle, and yet I knew that my mind could never know ease again until I had solved it.